Hello and welcome to Market Domination. I'm Josh Lipton alongside Madison Mills, live from our NYC headquarters. We're giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And from today's top investing stories, Yahoo Finance's trending tickers to the macroeconomic forces shaping markets, we'll dig deeper into everything you need to know for our last hour of the trading day. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. All in all, I expect a more hawkish Fed and I expect the market to have some difficulty because it's been based upon uh, a more dovish Fed, which we've seen in the past. The Fed dot plot could only show two rate cuts for 2024, which I think would obviously uh, be a bit of a, a shock to investors. This is a very big deal for Apple because it removes uh, the near term concern that Apple cannot implement uh, any Gen AI functions on iPhone due to its lack of infrastructure investments relative to other uh, large tech companies. One of the big things that, that most are looking for is for NVIDIA to announce some kind of new AI chip. NVIDIA is going to have to put something out that really gets that attention uh, of Chinese companies, even if it's not the best of the best that they have to offer. But NVIDIA, I don't think there's anything to be worried about in the immediate future of the cloud hyperscalers as well. Clearly, there's way too much demand versus supply, and they're in good shape. We've got about one hour till the market close, so let's get you up to speed on the market action here. We're seeing a lot of green across the globe here, and that's going to be driven primarily by that one big AI play. We never really talk about it. It's called NVIDIA, right? Leading to a lot of the gains that we're seeing across the globe here. But I want to take a look at some of the individual sector action here today. You can see all of those magnificent seven names finally becoming a little bit more magnificent, at least getting a little bit more of that momentum and conviction when it comes to the Magnificent Seven trade here. We're going to talk about that Apple and uh, Google news later on in our show. That's leading Apple to have a great day after they've really struggled year to date here, seeing Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Meta, Tesla, and NVIDIA all in the green today. Interesting to see some of the chip names and the divergence and bifurcation and some of that performance. SMCI added to the S&P 500 earlier today, but not having the best day when it comes to the overall overall performance for SMCI stock after getting added to the overall S&P. Just taking a quick look at some of these other names here that we're seeing. Google versus Meta performance here that you can see. We're seeing that Google is outperforming Meta today off of that news of that Apple and Google potential partnership in the iPhone moving forward. Uh, Josh, what else are you looking at today? Well, that's what we're looking at here, Madison. It, it, we got to talk about Alphabet today. That is a, a big mover in today's trade. Google's parent Bloomberg reporting here that Apple is in talks to license Google's Gemini AI technology to power AI features in new iPhones, which of course remains Apple's bread and butter. So think of functions like creating images or writing essays based on prompts. This would be big. It would be a high profile win for Google and its AI efforts. Remember, Apple, of course, has more than 2 billion active devices around the world. It also raises questions too, though, of course, because many assume that Apple's approach to AI would be like so much else Apple does, meaning they would want to do it in-house. They obviously mm -hmm. have the en engineers and the cash to do so. But if this report is accurate, maybe Tim Cook is instead looking to leverage a rival's AI technology, at least at first. Well, and that raises a really important question. Why did Apple have to go to a rival for the AI technology? We just got the news about Apple divesting from uh, electric vehicles, from the Apple car to generative AI. What does this say about where Apple is within the AI race? Also with in the uh, phone race as well, because we know that typically September is an important month when it comes to phone releases. Is this a little bit of a uh, play for them to get ahead of Samsung potentially releasing an AI powered phone moving into the fall here? It could be also, Matt, you know, Tim Cook is a very smart operator. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it too is, is Cook thinking, you know what, I will license this technology. I'll add in features I know people kind of want and expect. 
they'll enjoy it. I'll sell a lot of phones, make a lot of money. In the meantime, I'll learn how they use this tech. Yeah. I'll learn what they like and what they don't. And then as I always do, I'll release my own version. Maybe mm. it's maybe it's not as fast as others, but it's better than others. Right. It, the, it is. That's the kind of the Apple playbook could be what he's thinking. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. That is Apple's playbook. All right, stocks higher today with tech leading the way as investors are setting aside worries about stalled interest rates ahead of this week's FOMC meeting. For more on what to expect from Jerome Powell and company on Wednesday and how to best be positioned moving forward, let's welcome in Scott Cronert, City U.S. Equity Strategist, Managing Director. Scott, it is always good to see you. So, you know, it's interesting, Scott. Look at this market here. So, you know, we push back these expectations of when the Fed's going to cut and how much they're going to cut, Scott. And I got the yield on the 10-year back up to 433. But I see green across my screen here, Scott. All three major averages in the green right now. Uh, Josh, a great observation. I think what we're looking at here is, you know, ongoing confidence in a new growth engine for the broader market, courtesy of generative AI. You guys have covered that. Um, and what that does is it begins to put some bounds around the influence of the Fed, at least in a short-term basis, on the underlying market action. And, and right now, what you're looking at is, you know, consensus expectations, including, I think, out of our economists, is is for a uh, uh, a sort of a mid-year first Fed rate cut. So we'll be looking at the commentary. But all told, while you are navigating this interest rate influence under the surface, the market does seem to be getting more and more comfortable that there is an emerging incremental growth driver for equities, courtesy of generative AI. So given that, Scott, what matters more to equities this week, NVIDIA or the Fed? Maddie, I think it's probably the, the, the former, right? I, I think the Fed expectations are pretty well anchored. I don't know that we'll see too much. That's a distinct surprise. Although your point, right, on uh, the recent direction of 10-year nominal yields uh, up to 430 now is pretty relevant because all other things equal, that should begin to take some of the valuation wind out of the uh, MAG-7 sales. So, Scott, with the big Fed meeting you know, this week, I'm just interested, does the Fed have to cut for this market to move higher here, Scott, or no? We should stay focused on, on the economy and corporate profits. So, I, you know, again, it's, it's be careful what you're looking for. We want to see the Fed cut because they're in restrictive territory. We think that inflation gradually is decelerating. And so there's room for them to become less restrictive as we go through the balance of this year. On the other, on the other side of the coin, keep in mind um, that, that inflation has been a fundamental tailwind for uh, S&P 500 fundamentals. Nominal GDP is pretty highly correlated to sales. So to a certain degree, what you get with a little bit higher than uh, expected or wished for inflation is a little bit more confidence in underlying fundamentals. And on that front, we remain quite bullish on the S&P earnings picture this year, almost irregardless of the Fed action short term. Well, I'm curious then, because I know that you've talked about the increase in CapEx for the S&P 500 companies. It makes me wonder about this question of the impact of Fed rates that you kind of just mentioned. If large companies can continue to spend, can keep their debt financed at around 3 percent, is the Fed having an impact on corporate America? I think what we have to keep in mind is Wall Street versus Main Street. And I think, you know, the S&P 500 in aggregate beats to a little bit lesser economic drum than is commonly uh, perceived. As an example, the Bag 7, Big 7, uh, since a year ago at this time to now, 24 earnings growth expectations are 24% higher. And that's even with the Fed rate hike trajectory behind us. So to a certain degree, you, what you have to weigh here is where expectations for company specific and therefore industry growth are setting up versus um, the, the Fed response and whether that mechanism actually begins to choke it off. We think that that mechanism is a little bit less directly correlated than commonly perceived. Scott, I'm interested to get your take on, on another variable here, which is insider activity. And I asked Scott, just because I saw some interesting research today that said um, insider buying has been very light uh, versus selling. And some are saying, OK, well, that's a sign of caution by executives and directors. Just as a strategist, Scott, how much weight, if at all, do you place on that dynamic of insider activity? I think it's a little bit more relevant at the company specific level. Trying to make an aggregate conclusion off of it is, is difficult. You have to remember that most of the insiders that are you know, sort of C-suite components see a pretty decent percentage of their comp in the form of, uh, of stock-based compensation. And so you, what you, when you look for the insider buying signal, 
it's a, it's a little bit less dramatic than commonly perceived. Um, what I do want to do and make the point of, though, going back to Maddie's question on CapEx, is that when you look at where CEO spending intentions are here, they're starting to get a little bit more constructive. And in our minds are starting to set up for a little bit more of an early cycle discussion. So all in, insider buying, insider selling, we think in, in, in aggregate, it's, to, it's a positive read through for equities. When we look at what's happening with the uh, CapEx trajectories here, we think A, there's a catch up versus several years of, of no real incremental increase in CapEx from 2015 to say 2020. But now what we're seeing B is a more consistent uptake as companies are beginning to invest for future growth. That's a pretty big deal. Scott, thanks so much for helping us kick off the show today. I always appreciate your time. You bet. We're just getting started here on Market Domination. Coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Plus, we're heading out to Houston, Texas to check in with Julie Hyman at Zero Week as she sits down with Occidental CEO Vicki Hollum. You won't want to miss that chat. And the brand new season of our series, Next, kicks off today. We're diving into a huge challenge facing retailers theft. Be sure to tune in at 4.30 p.m. to see the full story of how the industry is cracked down by using AI. Stick around. More market domination is still to come. There's been a lot of acquisition activity in the oil and gas industry as of late, especially when it comes to large oil companies acquiring 
more shale. An example of that, Occidental agreeing to buy Crown Rock for $10.8 billion, an equity $12 billion total value. I'm here now uh, at the Sarah Week by S&P Global Conference with Vicki Holub, the CEO of Occidental. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, happy to be here. Yeah, let's, I want to talk about this acquisition first of all. You all acquiring Crown Rock, it was announced back in December. And of course, you're not the only one. We've seen this spate of acquisitions in the industry. What is this all about? What is the goal here in acquiring Crown Rock? I think every company has their own set of goals. For us, in the Permian Basin, we had a very large position in the Delaware, and that position uh, was uh, gave us the scale we need to bring the efficiencies of uh, not just the uh, proximity, but the size of what we're doing there. So. Uh, Delaware Basin was fine. We wanted to apply the same uh, model to the Midland Basin, but we had a position that was pretty small in the Midland Basin. So acquiring Crown Rock gives us a little more scale. Um, the scale also is in the right position, so it was a perfect fit with the assets that we already had. And in, in addition, it brought with it an inventory that actually helps to, to improve our inventory by fitting into Tier 1. Of, our, um, of the prospects that we have to, to drill in the future. So that was important. The other thing is it does bring forward cash flow. So part of the way we'll pay for uh, some of the acquisition is to sell some of our, um, our oil and gas areas that are further out in terms of development and time. So this is an acceleration of value to our shareholders, improving our inventory, uh, giving us the opportunity to become much more efficient in the Midland. And um, how's the timeline looking for selling off those assets that you mentioned to help fund this transaction? Yeah, we expect to, to meet our timeline that we laid out, and that's 12 months uh, past timeline for the initial phase, and then by 18 months, we'll have everything that we need to, to finalize what we wanted to do with the acquisition. And should investors think of this, I mean, when you talk about scale, you're not just talking about scale, you're also talking about efficiency, right? You're talking about profitability of these various um, shale areas. So should investors think of this as a one plus one equals two or some you know, exponent, exponent of that? It'll be one plus one equals more than two uh, because with what we'll be able to do with the efficiencies that we create, we'll create more value. Um, not only from that particular development, but again, it's the acceleration of value to the shareholders that from an MPV basis is much better. Now, I talked to one analyst um, after this transaction who talked about wondering if this is a sign accidental is moving a little bit back towards a low shareholder return phase. And was he was wondering when you'll get back to a sort of higher shareholder return phase. Can you talk to us about how you're thinking about that? If, if the shareholder return that, that he's talking about is buybacks, then uh, yes, we will, in the near term, over the next couple of years, we'll continue to pay debt down. Uh, post those two years, we'll get back to uh, repurchasing shares. Uh, we've had a very healthy repurchase program over the last couple of years because of the fact that our stock right now is very undervalued in our view. And so we think that, that the two important ways to return value to shareholders are through a growing dividend, which the, the Crown Rock acquisition does for us, and uh, to repurchase shares. Um, but also, we, we get a really good return on capital employed by investing organically in our oil and gas development. So those three things are the way that we can continue to create value for our shareholders. Um, I want to talk about another big project that you all are working on, and this is on the energy transition front, direct air capture, which is effectively pulling CO2 out of the air and trying to bury it underground, sequestering it. Um, this is something that I believe Occidental fairly uniquely is doing in the oil and gas business. Why did you decide to go that route versus capturing the CO2 that comes from the oil and gas processes? And what's the long-term outlook for this? Well, we've uh, actually been um, using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery for more than 50 years. And so that's a core competence of us. We know how CO2 works. We know how to manage it. Uh, we know how to, to deal with it. We have the infrastructure for it in the Permian Basin. And so for a long time, uh, we were trying to um, capture anthropogenic CO2 from industry. But that's a difficult process because when you're trying to get 
uh, an industrial site to commit to putting retrofitting equipment on their facility to capture carbon, that's not an easy negotiation. It's not an easy agreement to get to. And quite frankly, we started back in 2008 trying to make that happen. Uh, we couldn't make it happen with anybody. And then uh, we came across this uh, carbon engineering technology to extract CO2 out of the atmosphere. When we found that technology, that was more like the holy grail for us because now we didn't have to talk to any emitters. Um, all we had to do, we, and we controlled our own destiny with our schedule in terms of what pace we could develop these at and how well we could develop the, um, the direct air capture. And that allows us to, to do it when and where it makes sense to do. And the other thing about that technology is that just so happens that it's potassium hydroxide that'll extract the CO2 out of the air. We're the largest marketer of potassium hydroxide in the U.S., second largest in the world. And to make the mixing happen in the uh, contact tower so that you get the most efficiency that, and then pull the most CO2 out of the air, uh, you have to have the mixing hap happen in a good way. And PVC will help that. We'll be the diffuser in the tower and we make PVC too. So not only did we have the synergy with our oil and gas business of having used CO2 in enhanced oil recovery, uh, but also um, the synergies with the infrastructure that we have as a result of that, and, the, and then the synergies with chemicals. And it was like this was meant for us to do. When is it gonna make money? What's the timeline? Because it's uh, the economics of it, not, and not just with direct air capture, but what your rivals are doing, it's, it's quite difficult. Actually, we will um, have the, uh, the first phase of Stratos, which is our direct air capture facility that we're building in the Permian. That'll be up, starting up in mid next year. We've already sold um, about 70% of the carbon reduction credits for that 500,000 tons per year that we'll ultimately have um, and, uh, for that facility. And, and that's been going well. The, there is a demand from from airlines, from tech companies, and even from, uh, from a consulting company and some others that want to reduce their carbon footprint. This is the voluntary compliance market. These are people who care about their carbon footprint and who want to make a difference, want to offset that carbon footprint. Uh, they're buying these credits. So we will have cash flow coming in from that facility. But will it pay, when do you think it will pay for itself and actually get into the black? Uh, the payout really is dependent on, um, on what the credits are beyond what we've sold out today. We've, um, we've done a, a really good job, and so we haven't sold them all, but the, the cost of credits um, right now are, are going, going up because there's a limited number of reduction credits that uh, companies can buy. So I hope to be able to tell you in two years exactly what that looks like. But we'll, it's we'll evolving. Check, we'll check back in with you. <laughs> it's evolving and going well, actually. Vicki Hollum, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time here. Thank you. That was Yahoo Finance's Julie Hyman with Occidental CEO Vicki Holub at Sarah Wakes joining us now with more on what Occidental Petroleum shareholders may face in 2024. Let's bring in Portfolio Wealth Advisors President and CIO Lee Munson. Lee, it is good to see you there. So Occidental CEO Vicki Holub talked about this acquisition of Crown Rock. Lee uh, Holub saying, listen, this was about scale. It was about efficiency. It was about improving inventory. Uh, what do you think, Lee, of that acquisition? You believe it was is a smart move to make strategically and financially? Well, the, the strategy there it makes me shake my head a little bit. You know, when you look at the timing of early December when they made this acquisition, just 30 do, 32 days prior when they had quarterly reports, you know, management said that they weren't looking for any uh, acquisitions, that the Anadarko was fine and that they had $2 billion of synergies. And so it's funny that 30 days later, they bust out and say, oh, we're going to have to stop buybacks. Uh, we're now a dividend growth story. We just, you know, paid billions and billions of dollars for this new company. And, you know, the 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 narrative is fine. You know, they want to do what they've done the premiums. I, I get that. But I kind of wonder if they're, why is it that they said they weren't going to do it and now they are? Secondly, um, all this direct air capture and the carbon capture stuff, she's not able to answer the question of when it's going to be profitable. You know, there's this this thing in aviation, it's it's called Corsica, and it, it it's going to be in 2027 where you're, they're going to be buying carbon offsets and stuff. This is just a couple years away. So I think the fact that we were on schedule 
having 60% of a $3 billion buyback get done. Shareholders were told, hey, listen, we're going to be buying back. We're going to be paying down debt. We're not going to do any other acquisitions. In fact, we're going to look in the Permian Basin to sell some gas properties that aren't really key to what we want to do to fund buybacks. And now that's just off the table 30 days after they said that was the plan a few months ago. So for me, this stock is a real wait and see. Um, I understand that the CEO thinks it's very undervalued and it may remain undervalued. I'd rather wait to see what happens with the price of oil. We presume that it's just going to be here or go higher. I'd rather see the price of oil decline. If we're going to have a slowing growth this year, I want to see what the effects are. So I'm right now, I'm out of the stock right now. I love to watch it. I think mm -hmm. Vicky's a great CEO but it's a wait and see. Well, it's interesting because I hear you really honing in on this change after 30 days, and that's something that you can get a lot of clarity on when you get the opportunity to speak with a leader. What was the change in thinking? Was there anything from her comments that you just heard that gave you a little more clarity on that shift in movement? Yeah, I mean, I understand what they're trying to do now. They're trying to you know, increase the reserves. What they're trying to do is, you know, is here's what they're trying to do. They're trying to acquire stuff that they can finance with some debt mm -hmm. and immediately say, we can improve uh, sh shareholder value by, by increasing dividends. That's not what I wanna hear. You know, I, I understand what she's saying. I think it sounds like a good strategy, but that's not why I own the stock. And that's not what I think is gonna make things good move forward. If the business was strong, if their setup was good, I don't think they would have to make this acquisition. I would have preferred that Vicky said something like, we weren't planning on doing this at all, but we got this incredible deal. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't resist the price. The price was right, we did it, but it comes off like this was always the strategy. And that's that's to me, that's a tell that tells me I just want to take a break from the stock for a little while. Haley, I'll get you out of this. What about the fact that you know you got Warren Buffett? Uh, carving out a stake in this one. The Oracle himself, Lee, you know, greatest value investor of all time. How does that, if at all, play into kind of your assessment of, of this company? Oh, it was one of the main reasons why I uh, identified the stock. It was one of the main reasons why I bought it. You know, last year, I think I might have bought some in 22, 23. I forgot exactly the day I, I first started purchasing it. But, you know, Warren Buffett's a great idea generator, right? And, and I think that there was a thought over a year ago that he represented a floor on the price and but the problem is is that the stock isn't moving it's not making much money they've subtly changed directions of course it all sounds very good but i don't see the energy right and so you know warren buffett's a very very long long-term investor i again i would rather wait for the price of the stock to start moving up i'd rather like to see when the share buybacks start coming back i'd like to see how much money we're wasting on direct air uh, capture and to see if that's even something that's going to grow and move the needle. If not, it's just wasting my time. I would rather have a more pure play. So at this point, I understand why Buffett was interested. Today, I'm on my own and that has less bearing. I love when we get a guest that goes against the Warren Buffett there. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee. Really appreciate your context on that interview. Thank you. It's time now to look at some of our analyst calls of the day. We're going to start with Nike, getting a downgrade to sell by Williams Trading Analyst Sam Poser, who also cut his price target from 92 down to 85. Poser saying Nike is losing its luster and is not doing enough to shine. Shares of the shoemaker are lower on the day, down by about half a percentage point here. What this note really comes down to is a lack of compelling new products. And he notes a couple of different factors leading to that. He talks about lack of relentless self-criticism compared to Nike's heyday, which I thought was a little bit of shade. Uh, strategy decisions led by consultants rather than the Nike experts. And leadership being a little too dogmatic and not necessarily going with their gut instincts. And we've seen this across the board. If you look at a lot of the different players when it comes to the consumer discretionary space, I think about uh, Nike's performance year to date versus is some of the other competitors when we think about a Deckers, which we're going to talk about getting added to the S&P 500. You've also got a Foot Locker, one of the suppliers, um, rather the uh, wholesalers that Nike tends to work with. Uh, so looking, moving forward here, looking to a little bit of a more successful commercialization for this name. That's what's going to potentially be a boon for them, particularly when it comes to new styles like the upcoming Air Max. Yeah, Sam Poser, just so viewers understand, I mean, Sam is a longtime financial analyst. 
first, and he's been covering Nike for a long time. So that's why when I saw this note, it really got my attention. Mm. Sam just knows the company and the industry so well, and it, it, this was a really mm. rough note. Yeah. I mean, and he really targets the leadership in particular at Nike. Senior leaders are too dogmatic. They don't welcome all opinions. Many of those driving the direction of the company, he says, are using spreadsheets, not educated gut. That was another um, one, yeah. All this, he says, is gonna drive short and long-term challenges to sales and margin growth. Now, we do get Nike's report on Thursday, and there, Sam told his clients he sees a slight miss coming, thinks 2024 guidance is gonna be cut again. Um, it, it, we should know, listen, Sam is in the minority here. I mean, mm -hmm. most analysts still think Nike is a buy. That doesn't mean Sam is wrong, though. Right. That does not mean that. So we'll wait and see what they report. Absolutely. Got interesting. Okay. Moving on, Netflix getting a boost today on the back of a few bullish calls. Both JP Morgan and Loop Capital reiterated their overweight buy rings with Loop Capital raising the firm's price target on Netflix to 700. Uh, this one was interesting. So Netflix, by the way, hit a 52 week high in today's trade, Maddie. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's up about 20% now since their Q4 report. Team at JP Morgan continues to like what they see here, pound the table for this one. Among the reasons they told their clients, they think Netflix can accelerate revenue growth in 2024. They think they can expand margins and drive a multi-year free cash flow ramp they talk about on improving profit and, and uh, cash content discipline. Also, I love how they talk, how Netflix is building out this sports on content in particular. Well, we know that they're gonna be streaming that fight between Mike Tyson and Jake Paul, which we were talking about a little bit earlier today. They've got this WWE partnership in the works. There's this question out there about how much Netflix is going to be able to profit off of the interest in live sports and streaming, but also they were so successful in their recent earnings print. They kind of started this narrative of earnings season that it's not just the big tech names that are going to succeed mm -hmm. with, I mean, remember that one analyst who coined the Magnificent Eight and included Netflix in those eight names? It's really just done so incredibly well, and I think their ability to get people to pay for a subscription that doesn't have passwords is a really critical part of that. Yeah, I like the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul fight, which by the way is this summer, it's in July. They say, we believe the fight could be the most watched boxing fight ever, given the ease of access and Netflix's large global subscriber base. Yeah, I mean, the stock up 32% year to date. I feel like me and my friends watching Love is Blind reunion mm. definitely led to that, and then you and yeah. your friends this summer. Yeah. It's gonna be a double win for them. You gonna watch Tyson? You I am not gonna watch Tyson. Oh, come but on. but I, I, I'm gonna try to sell you. You in can the break. you can pitch me on it on the break. There we go. All right. Well, coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around. More market domination still to come.
It's a big noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal is to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. And today, we're tapping into the auto industry, sticky inflation and elevated rates, adding fuel to the competitive vehicle market as competition heats up for auto sales. What's the best way to play the space? Well, I'm here with Michael Ward, Freedom at Capital Markets Managing Director. Mike, it's good to see you. Hey, Justin. All right, so let's start with one name you do like, Mike. So call it up here. The first name we're going to like is General Motors, right? That's a buy. There's a few reasons for this one, Mike. So let's go over them. One is, we'll start here, your first bullet. Balance sheet is in great shape, Mike. Right. And people forget, you know, if you looked on Bloomberg or FactSet or anything and you looked up General Motors, it would show that they had $100 billion of debt. That includes GM Financial. Mm. If you look at just the auto company, GM ended the year last year with about $5 billion of positive cash. So total cash, less debt. Got it. Second bullet, Mike, let's go over this one. Surplus cash expectations in 24 and 25. GM generated about 24% of its market cap in surplus cash from its auto operations. This year, you're gonna probably see somewhere between five and $10 billion of surplus cash. That's operating cash flow, less cap spending. And their current market cap is about $45 billion. All right, sounds pretty good. Final point here, Mike, in your bull thesis, attractive valuation, how come? If you look at General Motors, I think there's this sentiment towards General Motors and the auto sector in general. Mm. Apathy is the best way to describe it. The, the least amount of interest in the group that I've seen in the 40 years that I've followed wow. the stocks. Wow. That's always a buy signal yeah. to me. General Motors right now is valued at under two times 24 and 25 on an EV to EBITDA basis. It should be trading three to five. Over the last couple of years, it's been trading at four plus. All right, so it's looking it's looking cheap based on those metrics. Before they pile in, though, Mike, what should viewers know about risk? What's the risk to the bull call? Always risks with the autos. I always tell people on the autos, they're capital intensive, labor intensive, cyclical, low growth, highly competitive, highly regulated. Got it. If that doesn't scare you away, nothing does. <laughs> right. All right, so that's the bull. Let's let's talk about a name, Mike, you don't like, right? So a name to avoid, in your opinion, Carvana. Let's go through some of the reasons here as well. First reason, scaled back growth plans. Carvana is a great company. They've created a great brand on the used vehicle side of the market. It's a forty, it's a trillion dollar market, mm. and they establish a brand name. What I worry about is valuation. Last year, they got into trouble with an acquisition, too much debt, not generating positive cash. They had to scale back, scale back growth objectives. It's trading as a hyper growth company, and it's not. It had negative growth last year, single digit growth in twenty four and twenty five. Second reason here, investors are saying about, you said, inconsistently in making positive cash flow from operations. Yeah, they're generating negative cash. Last year, they had some one-time items that produced uh, $800 million of surplus cash, but this company is, is going to generate negative cash of a half a billion to a billion dollars this year. Next, they have a heavy debt load, and so, you know, to me, that eventually will catch up to them. Final reason you would steer clear of this, Mike, let's talk about it. price volatility, obtaining cars and higher marketing spend. Yeah, it, their brand name is key. And everybody's seen, you know, the, the machines that they sell the cars with, the vending machines. Uh, you have to spend a lot of money marketing to get that point across. When they go out to get their inventory to sell, they have to buy the cars in the used vehicle market. Everything with COVID and shortages and everything else, it caused a lot of volatility. You, you look at the CPI data just the other day. A 1.8% decline in used vehicle prices is huge. Mm. You're talking about prices that usually go up fractions of a percentage point. They have to buy the vehicles at the market, fix them up, and then sell them retail. That creates risk to the model. A new vehicle dealer knows exactly what they're paying for a vehicle, and everybody else is paying the same price. If Carvana get, guesses wrong and buys a lemon or used vehicle prices go the other way, they're going to be stuck paying more for inventory and make less money. All right, final, final idea here, Mike, though. So you've got to sell on this name, but what are, the, what are kind of the, the upside risks to that call? Uh, look, it is a great brand name. They establish a very good brand name. If we saw flattening out in used vehicle prices, we saw them get it together from an operating cash flow standpoint, and they were starting to generate positive cash, that would be a big plus. You already saw the earnings better than expected, and you had a big short squeeze. It had a huge mm. short position in the stock. So between operating cash and the short squeeze, I didn't see the latest data on the short numbers, but I'm guessing a lot of that was cleared up with 4Q earnings. Got it. All right, so let, Mike, let's sum this up for, for viewers here. So investors, you're saying buy GM with its attractive valuation, balance sheets in great shape, and the expectations in future surplus cash. On the other hand, you're saying avoid Carvana amid the disadvantages it faces, new vehicle dealerships, its inability to consistently generate positive cash. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye or goodbye. We're going to bring bringing you new episodes so it's three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Josh. You got it, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you. That was great, man. That was great.
It's time now for a look at some of the day's trending tickers as we approach the closing bell now on Wall Street. We're going to look at shares of Rivian riding higher as its vehicles will now be able to access the Tesla supercharger network. Shares of both of these names, both Rivian and Tesla, up after that news with Tesla up about 6.5% and Rivian up a little over 3% here uh, as we head into the end of the day. But this is kind of similar to Tesla's deal with Ford. Rivian owners are going to have access to that massive of supercharger network by Tesla, uh, the largest DC fast charging system with over 15,000 chargers. So definitely seen as a way to expand access to charging systems for these electric vehicles, Josh, which is a really important component when we continue to hear reports that consumers have struggled with finding ways to charge their electric vehicles. That's one of the reason one of the reasons that we've seen companies like a Hertz, for example, trying to offload these cars um, along with kind of the resale value going down over about uh, eight years after the battery starts to stall there. So it's interesting to see the street really rewarding both of these names for that charging capability. Yeah, there was another headline here too, Maddie, that I thought was interesting. We did have news at Tesla. I saw these reports is going to raise the price of its Model yep. Y cars, um, at least in the U.S. and some European countries. And you saw Tesla kind of move on that news. I do wonder if that sort of help give a kind of general lift to broader EV stocks in today's trade as well. Well, Rivian also getting a little bit of a boon coming into Friday, getting an upgrade off of offering some additional new products that analysts were saying were just too cool to ignore. So, you know, you got to you gotta look at stuff like that, too, when you're covering it. markets. All right, we move on. We've got Super Micro Computers and Deckers Outdoor make their S&P 500 debuts. Shares of Super Micro Computer giving, us, giving up earlier gains in the trading day. I think this is about the only thing these two names have in common, mm -hmm. I, I think, Maddie. Um, yep. But S Super Micro, so listen, the shares were, they were kind of, I mean, you can see there in the red today, but I, the maker of servers, of course. Of course, um, you got to pull back the chart on this one because it's been a monster. Investors we know have been so hungry to try to play AI different ways, and they look to NVIDIA or Broadcom or AMD, and, and Super Micro has been another one they have moved hard into. It's up about 240% already this year. It's up about 900% over the past 12 months, Maddie. Well, it's really interesting to me to see SMCI perform performing so poorly today, given that they, as you mentioned, have had such a stellar year. They're up 12-fold over the course of the year. Uh, NVIDIA, which we always talk about, their growth up only fourfold in that same time period. So just really on a tear there. But we do have a history of companies joining the S&P 500 and then having a little bit of a stall after they do join here. So it's not incredibly surprising, but it is interesting, particularly given that we are heading into this NVIDIA Developers Conference, that you would see a name like this struggling that is so tied to NVIDIA's performance. So, yeah, we'll have to see. And Decker's Outdoor, by the way, I, I get it, not quite as buzzy as AI, the maker of Ugg Boots. Yes. For example. Yeah, but yes. I have been sleeping on Decker's Outdoor. That stock is up 120% over the past 12 months. Well, this what is move. this is Uggs, this is Hoka Shoes, and we've yeah. seen these direct-to-consumer brands really performing super well in comparison to the Nikes of the world that we talked about. Look They're at that still, chart. Look at this chart, right? In incredible performance here because of that direct-to-consumer move that they've been able to really capitalize off of, whereas you still have a Nike relying on Foot Locker, stores with traffic. Um, having said that, we're going to move on to a final pick here. Shares of Nuve surging as it reportedly nears a buyout deal. The Ryan Reynolds-backed payments processor is in advanced talks with Advent International. That is according to reporting from the Wall Street Journal. And shares of this company were up over 32%, yeah, nearing 33% here in the afternoon. That is the highest ever intraday increase after these reports on a potential deal. Now, we have had reports about a deal in the past, but it does seem like they are nearing a potential buyout deal here. So getting a little bit of that clarity, clearly a good move for this name today. Yeah, I mean, not, Ryan Reynolds might like this company, but some really don't. I mean, you saw yeah. sh short sellers have published tough reports on this company, you know, question its financial transactions. Transparency and it has been a rough going. I mean, I, it's a you know big surge today. It's higher now for this year, but it's still down about thirty percent over the past twelve months. Though most on the street are actually bullish. If you look at financial analysts who cover this name, maybe in part because they expect a, a headline like this. Right. Yes. It's it's interesting when you see an acquisition doing well for a name that. It, it depends on the pricing usually. Really, you want to short Ryan Reynolds? I mean, come on. You can't Is that the that. move? Yeah, Hollywood superstar. All right, coming up, we're looking at how to navigate the markets with the Yahoo Finance playbook. Stay tuned, more market domination still to come.
With less than 15 minutes till our closing bell on Wall Street, we're going to look at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. Today, we're taking a closer look at the prices you pay, whether you're at the grocery store or you're going out to eat. We're highlighting companies that have pricing power in this environment and how you should consider making investment decisions in the restaurant and consumer goods spaces. And joining us now is Jeffrey's Managing Director, Andy Barish, and B of A Securities Senior CPG Analyst, Brian Spillane. Andy and Brian, it's good to have both you guys on the show today. Uh, maybe, Andy, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you know, you cover the restaurant sector, Andy. That, that's a, a, lot of, a lot of names and a lot of different subsectors. I guess just to start, Andy, maybe 30,000-foot um, view as you look across your coverage universe, Andy. How, how healthy is it right now as a sector? What do underlying demand trends look like? Yeah, thank, thanks for having uh, both of us on. Um, yeah, it's been better than expected, I would say. But, you know, there is some choppiness in traffic. Um, you know, same store sales for a lot of the industry has been driven by price and mixed to some extent. And there aren't a lot of uh, companies that are driving traffic growth right now. So um, I think, you know, this is a really relevant conversation, everyday value and uh, the ability to, um, you know, be a little bit more promotional in a smart way is going to kind of dictate um, success or, or, or less than that over the, you know, the rest of 2024. Brian, talk to me about the same thing for your sector. How's the health looking? So it, it really depends on the, the sub-segment. So as we look across our coverage, um, revenue trends are probably most normal in beauty, household, par household products, and personal care uh, categories. Food and beverage, a little bit mixed. You know, both the beer and the spirits categories, actually volumes have decelerated um, pretty meaningfully over the last six months and, and really uh, more so ar around the holidays and afterwards. And for the food companies, um, it's been uh, really volume declines, right? These are the companies that probably pushed pricing the or definitely pushed pricing the most over the last few years in, in, the, um, in the face of all the, the inflation they, they seen, uh, they were realizing, but they also have really had the most demand destruction. And, you know, we're really watching this as we move into the spring and summer, as some of the government benefits like SNAP benefits, which were, were cut a year ago, begin to anniversary to see if we begin to normalize volumes there. But again, I would say it's a pretty mixed picture uh, depending on the category. Andy, one big theme I know for your space um, would be geopolitics to some extent, Andy. I think of some of the names you cover, like McDonald's, which is which is called that out um, as a headwind. How does that playing out across your coverage universe, Andy? What are some of the ripple effects from that specifically you're seeing? Yeah, it, it's not a, a huge part of anyone's business in particular. Most, if not all, of the exposure to the Middle East is um, through license or franchise, but clearly it is the you know, the large uh, multinationals like McDonald's, like Starbucks, um, Yum! brands that, um, you know, in particular have seen, you know, some pushback against, um, you know, against American brands given the, uh, the conflict going on. I, I, I would also uh, be remiss not to mention, um, you know, China coming uh, more into the equation depending on what happens um, in November with the election, obviously, which, um, you know, is a, is a little bit of a larger exposure for some of those same companies that I just mentioned. Well, I'm curious then, um, going back to you, Brian, to what extent do geopolitical factors play into these CPG names as well, particularly when it comes to China? I know that a lot of these kind of dividend-paying stocks are within your coverage area. Do you see the China story as a significant headwind for those names moving forward? You know, China's been, um, you know, the biggest negative driver for Estee Lauder over the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's been a combination of some company-specific issues in China as well as the macro there. Um, we look at Procter & Gamble, right, which, you know, China softness was about 100 basis point drag to their organic sales in, the, in, the, in their fiscal second quarter. So China itself has, has played, again, for us, it's mostly, you know, selling products in country. So it's more of a consumer demand. And I say it's, it's probably been less geopolitical um, and more just the macro, you know, the consumer sort of tightening their belts to a certain degree and normalization of travel. But again, it's the multinationals and, and Estee Lauder probably the most specific, uh, specific to China. And I would say just in terms of Middle East, 
and um, Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, some of the other uh, countries uh, where there's been some protests uh, related or, or co consumers um, acting or, or taking actions against U.S. brands. It's really been the beverages, like Coke and Pepsi have, have called that out as, um, you know, a, a source of weakness in this first quarter and, and potentially now as we go through Ramadan in, in March. Well, I know that you have covered General Mills, and Walmart had a note out about General Mills about a year ago talking about how um, General Mills was basically forcing them to push up prices. They were charging too much. Are you still seeing that dynamic playing out between the CPG brands and the retailers themselves, that kind of infighting about the inflation of goods? Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't think I've ever faced a customer who didn't like, who liked the price increase. So I think there's always normal tension between a manufacturer and a retailer in terms of price. But that said, um, without, except, with the exception of where there's real evidence of costs inflating, um, I think right now the, the, the temperature on price increases is really cool. Most of the companies that I cover have more or less price to inflation, so their, their mm. margins are somewhat protected. And the focus now is really driving volume. So I think that that, that, that conversation has definitely shifted more towards now let's try to drive some volume versus uh, out seeking additional price increases right now. Andy, final one to you here. Let's, let's give viewers some names to consider. It was, it was interesting. I saw, Andy, your team recently upgraded Utz Brands uh, to a buy, Andy. Um, that, listen, that's, that's a tasty chip. But wh why is that a, a smart place to commit, commit capital for viewers? Brian, I think, yeah, I think that one's yeah, for you. Yeah, I think it was, it, that oh, was, was going to say, you, Brian? go Sorry. for it, Andy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we did. We, we upgraded us last week. Uh, we had, um, and our, our view there is, is really around two things. One, uh, you know, this is a regional expansion story. So their brands are, are, are mainly regional brands going for national distribution. Um, the the um, pathway to... Uh, you know, increased points of distribution, more store counts is actually pretty, um, pretty clear right now. And we think that's going to drive growth higher than category over, over the next year or two. We also think thematically, as we look across our coverage universe, we do think that self-help is a theme that we'll see continue. And in that self-help, uh, you know, category, one of the tools is, is, is M&A. And we think mm -hmm. that, you know, companies looking to acquire growth um, or, or, or add growth to their to their portfolios. Salty snacks, snacking is is has been a, a good area of growth, and we think Uts could potentially um, you know fit that need for for uh, larger companies looking to to add some growth to their portfolios. So it's a little bit of you know expansion in addition to there be a thematic uh, play to it as well. Andy, really quickly to end with you, I want to ask you about the dynamic Brian was mentioning with CPG names looking for more volume than increased pricing. Are you seeing that same dynamic playing out at restaurants and for food away from home? Yeah, I think, I think we are, Maddie. It's, um, you know, it's an environment where um, very little promotion or discounting has gone on over the last couple of years, um, you know, given the relatively strong you know, demand pull. And I think we're seeing smart promotion now, mostly uh, bundled or through uh, rewards programs. Um, so the the companies get data on those consumers yeah. and, and can, can drive some lifelong value um, from that instead of just giving away uh, food with a buy one, get one. And, you know, I, I think McDonald's is doing as good a job as anybody. They they tend to, um, yep, yep. you know, win in whatever environment, particularly right now with their digital properties sure. very strong, the rewards, yeah. McDonald's rewards very strong. And, you know, the brand relevance as good as it's been in a long, long time. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you both so much for joining us, Andy and Brian. We really do appreciate it. We're going to have you all covered with the market action following the closing bell. So stay tuned right here. More market domination overtime to come.
is the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it's market domination over time. So we're going to get you up to speed on the action from today's trade. Look at this beautiful sea of green, at least for the Magnificent Seven names here. I'm looking specifically at Google and Apple. Much bigger win on the day for Google, up over 4.5% off of that news with the Apple iPhone here. Apple up just a little over a half a percent there on the day. NVIDIA up 7 tenths of a percent. We'll be interested in hearing and seeing how that stock stock continues to perform as we get news from that developers conference later on today. Interesting to continue to see Tesla really outperforming when it comes to the other magnificent seven names here on the day up a little over 6%. Uh, that could be off of that pricing news that we got increasing the price of that Model Y out of Europe and of course here in the United States as well. I just want to take a quick look at some of the other major averages here. We're seeing yeah, green across all of your major indices here. We've got uh, the Dow Jones up two tenths of a percent, the Nasdaq ending the day up eight tenths of a percent, and we've got the S&P 500 up six tenths of a percent as well. So I'm going to see if I can get over to anything related to NVIDIA here. Let's take a look at least. This is one of the charts that I can pull up. Uh, NVIDIA here is up seven tenths of a percent on the day here, and we're going to continue to monitor NVIDIA's performance as we get more news from that developers conference today. Josh, what do you got for us? Yeah, so Matt, and speaking of NVIDIA, listen, that big annual show is kicking off right now. And we know expectations, of course, are sky high. The stock is a monster. It's already up about 80% already this year. So can CEO Jensen Wong deliver? It's going to be a two-hour keynote. Questions for today, of course, what do we hear about that new GPU, dubbed the B100? What color could we get there on price, performance? Has it stack up against the competition? Remember, this is the successor to NVIDIA's H100. Also, any, any more color we get about partnerships, about collaborations, those are always in focus. And more broadly, what does Jensen Wong say about the AI, AI market, both how big it is now, Maddie, and how big he thinks it will ultimately become? Well, it's interesting, too, when we look at some of the semiconductor stocks that we've been talking about so much, the Philadelphia Semiconductor index falling 4% last week. So some of these other names could use some good news from NVIDIA. I mean, even an SMCI, which was soaring heading into their addition to the S&P 500 today and then down about 8% in the trade as we come into the close. So it's interesting for me to see how these other chips plays are going to perform off of any NVIDIA news specifically related to that additional chip All right, play we'll watch and see. Yep. Stocks looking to rebound after two straight weeks of declines as investors eye this week's Fed decision. Josh Schaefer is here with us take, with his takeaways of the day, Josh. Yeah, Josh. I mean, I was perusing the different headlines from us and various financial mm -hmm. news networks today and I this morning, and I would have thought stocks would fall. It, it felt like we were, the conversation this morning was about, we're going to learn that the Fed is going to cut maybe less than we hoped, mm -hmm. and we might see overall less cuts, maybe later cuts. It seems like we're starting to already get worried about what is going to happen at this Wednesday meeting. Mm -hmm. And then I take a look at the market action today, and that is not what happened. Mm -hmm. We rallied about almost 1% in the S&P 500, and we had a 1% rally in the NASDAQ. But what I want to highlight here, guys, is sort of the divergence that we did see between what did underperform, right? So when we take a look at what underperformed today, you could look at small caps underperformed. Uh, we have home builders underperforming. We have regional banks underperforming. And the reason I highlight this is sort of the chart that we have up here now. This is a chart from Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. And he was pointing out the different moves we've seen in small caps versus large caps in relation to interest rate movements. Mm -hmm. We've seen large caps be a lot more resilient to the moves we've seen in rates over the last month compared to small caps. I'm highlighting this because I'm curious what we see on Wednesday. If we can continue to see yields go higher and sort of the overall anticipation, the pricing in of less cuts, is it another day where small caps just significantly sink compared to the S&P 500? I like to use small caps because to me that's sort of become part of the proxy of this soft landing trade, of this mm -hmm. we're going to get a lot of cuts trade. Small caps mm -hmm. ripped on that. Right. And now we're seeing them still react more but that resilience we're seeing in large caps that we did see again today could be what maybe holds us up, depending on what comes mm. up Wednesday. Yeah. Go ahead, Maddie. Well, I just think it's interesting. I remember on Friday we were talking about how uh, typically, historically, it, it had been the day in March where the market hits its lowest lows for the last mm. 20 years. So there was a little bit of seasonality coming into play that made me think we might be in the green this morning. But then it's always fascinating when you look at the bifurcation that we're seeing in treasuries and you see the two-year yield climbing to its highest 
highs for the year. What is going on with that? These are supposed to move in different directions. Mm -hmm. I just don't. And, and then, doing? at what point do investors care about the ten-year yield moving higher? Right. right. We've had the ten-year kind of chugging higher for basically it feels like a month or two now, at least rel relatively consistently on a trend basis, right? When does and, it bite? Yeah. And when does that actually matter to equities again, right? Wilson yeah. highlighted in his note 4.35%. I think we're right there right now. Maybe it was 4.34%. But sort of saying we're getting to that level now mm -hmm. where we're going to start talking about bond yields being higher. And even if you're just a stock investor that just owns something like the index, it might be time to start paying attention to it mm. again. Yeah. And especially as yields move higher too, Josh, it's interesting to see the re repercussions. Like you would think uh, tech wouldn't work against that, those interest rate aims. But yeah. takeaway two for today, Josh, yeah. what if you have an AI play? Then yeah. it always works, right? Even if yields are going up. And I wanted to highlight, I wanted to highlight the announcement from Alphabet today because I found it particular, or I shouldn't say announcement, sorry, the report mm -hmm. that Alphabet may be included, uh, Gemini AI may be included on iPhones. We saw a big move in shares of Google on this, a nearly 5% move in the stock from that, and it just stuck out to me because I couldn't name a tech company that needed more of an AI win, yeah. right? It just, so they, needed, they needed to have an AI and, um, rumor, I guess we'll call it, news come out and then see the stock go up for once rather than having some of these AI announcements and rumors that have come out about them, and it really hasn't done well on some of those trades. So to me, it stuck out just to see shares go up in that reaction, and then also for Apple shares to not necessarily fall on this news. Mm. There's a read of this report where you could say, so Apple's not building their own AI, exactly. that's not good, right. right? Where's Apple's involvement here? Still but not maybe, in the AI race. Maybe it's actually just a smart play from Apple, right? Yeah, that's what, that's what we were talking about off camera, Josh, about how, how Evercore kind of saw it, right? Uh, AI features without AI CapEx, is how mm. they put it, yeah. You were looking at comm services as well, Josh, for yes. your takeaways? Yes, yes, our final takeaway, is just, I love to look at the sectors and just click on the year to date. Yep. Sometimes on the Wi Fi Interactive, it's pretty fun. It's a pretty fun activity for me during the day. <laughs> and when we take a look at that, you look at communication services here, up 11% on the year. It was up 2% today. But what stands out to me here, too, Maddie, that really I found interesting, look at what is underperforming the SP 500. Minimally, I should add, but tech. And it just sort of mm. reminds us of when we talk about tech broadly what's actually in the tech sector versus what's actually in the communication services sector. And so you see tech technically underperforming the S&P 500 here for the year, but communication services outperforming, and that's because today we saw a jump in communication services from that jump we were just talking about in Alphabet. Meta's had a great year, Netflix has had a great year. And so it's just interesting to me, I feel like we talk a lot about tech is still leading the market, tech is still leading the market. Just to note, we're not always talking about XLK. Yeah. We might be talking about the NASDAQ, but right. we're not always talking about XLK. It's some other sectors, too, that are participating here, and that one stuck out to me today because it was up 2%. Mm -hmm. It's a great point for any retail investors who are looking to tech-specific ETFs. Just mm. remember to look under the hood a little bit when you're, <laughs> when you're on the Robinhood app. Josh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, as always, here. Uh, Treasury yields, we were just talking about, seeing little change as investors are looking ahead to the Fed's March meeting. Our next guest says that yields are recalibrating for a higher for longer reality with the market now pricing in less than three full rate cuts this year. For more on fixed income, we're going to bring in Truist Fixed Income Managing Director Chip Huey. Chip, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you were probably overhearing our conversation here with the two-year Treasury notes yield climbing to its highest level this year. So I want to get your take on that movement that we've seen today. When does that start to bite the broader market? Yeah, it's great to be with you this afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, I think that the, what you're seeing is yields recalibrate for three primary reasons, right? One, we continue to see sticky inflation data really all year. Last week's PPI was, was no exception. That feeds into number two, which means that the Fed is likely now having to be on hold for longer than the market was anticipating, right? And holding rates at these restrictive levels uh, for, for longer than was expected coming into the end of the year. And we're also contending with really strong treasury issuance, right? The US government is probably going to issue roughly $2 trillion in new debt this year. That's a lot of supply. But I do think that the biggest the biggest factor uh, for yields has been the Fed pricing in six to seven rate cuts for this year coming into 2024. And as you just mentioned uh, in the previous in the previous segment, that's down to actually below three now. So that's a big change that has real implications on the yield curve. And Chip, I'm just interested, when do you think you know the Fed starts cutting and, and how deep? 
Yeah, I think I think that the, the Fed is going to have that sufficient amount of evidence that inflation is cooperating around mid-year. So I think that the Fed has its initial rate cut around the, the midpoint of this year and ultimately lowers uh, lowers the Fed funds rate two additional times with so three rate cuts uh, the, uh, you know, as, as we progress through the year, ultimately totaling about three cuts in 24. And Chip, just to follow on that though, you know, you've heard this kind of, um, kind of growing chorus from pretty well-respected economist, Chip, who are mm -hmm. thinking there's increasing chance of no cuts. I think of guys like you know, Dr. Ed Yardetti. I, I think Dr. Ed's base case is still cut, two cuts this year, but he did tell clients, Chip, you know, increasing um, chance here, there's no cuts. What, what do you make of that argument? I think that I think it's fair that that's that's an increasing chance. We just don't think that that's what's ultimately going to happen. We do expect inflation to continue to cool. It's going to be a bumpy path, right? We've seen that, and so we think that the Fed again will see that inflation is cooling um, as as the year progresses. And if inflation is cooling and yields are and the Fed funds rate is still at this level, it's becoming increasingly restrictive. So we do think that as inflation carves this bumpy path lower, the Fed will ultimately sort of chase that down a bit lower. But we never subscribe to the idea that the Fed was going to get to six, seven you know, rate cuts and, and start back, you know, as of right now, right, start this month. That was not that was not what we ever really ascribed to. We knew that we felt that the, the Fed was going to be very patient given the inflationary environment that we've just been through for the past couple of years. Very patient and definitely still kind of searching for a thesis, it feels like, even though they just say their thesis is that they're data dependent. Um, having said that, I want to ask you about where our audience of retail investors here on Yahoo Finance should be putting their money if they want to get invested in fixed income. We know that we are at an all-time high of $1.66 trillion in dividends for 2023. For those in our audience who have raked in the benefits of those dividends, where within fixed income should they be playing right now? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think we would emphasize quality, right? Right now in, in the higher quality areas of fixed income, yields remain really productive. Areas like US treasuries, right? Like tips for those investors looking for a little bit of inflation protection, investment grade municipals, absolute yield levels are still very productive and very attractive. When you look at the riskier portions of fixed income, credit spreads to us seem a little bit misaligned. They're very low, they're very, they're very tight. And we do expect to see spreads widen as the economy slows, as what the Fed has done continues to bite. And what we see in some of the riskier corners of fixed income is fundamentals actually deteriorating. And we've seen instances of default rise. So we think there will be an opportunity to add credit risk into portfolios, but we'll be patient right now and really focus on the higher quality areas I just mentioned. And uh, Chip, I want to get your take on this. When I look at the yield on the benchmark 10-year, where do you think that actually heads from here, Chip? Do you think we test last year's high? Yeah, it's a great question. There, there is a major technical threshold at 435. We are right there, right? 433 today. We, we're trying to test it. We've tested it maybe four or five times so far this year. So we're watching that 435 level very carefully. If we do pierce that level, because we have not been able to do that so far this year, it probably sets up a pretty quick move up to about four and a half percent. But what we have seen is that there is a lot of international demand, demand from areas like pension funds, annuity uh, providers, also retail investors who would, would who would seem to be attracted to uh, to treasuries at that level. We would see demand step in if we get to that point. So we we do think that we set the high watermark in the 10 year back in October when we went briefly above uh, five percent. And we do also think that even if we get these periods of upward moves in yields, we think that we kind of trend lower as we progress through the year, as as the economy uh, slows from really, really resilient readings uh, before, as inflation cools, and, and again, as the Fed starts to lower rates. Chip, it was great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. NVIDIA founder and CEO Jensen Wong's keynote getting underway at the Chip Giants GTC event. We're following the action and we'll bring you highlights throughout the program. Keep it right here on Market Domination Overtime.
You're watching Yahoo Finance. I'm Julie Hyman, and of course, AI has infused everything, even the energy industry. I'm here at the Sarah Week by S&P Global Conference in Houston, Texas, where the industry gathers to talk about all of the pertinent issues, and of course, AI is on that list. And so my next guest, perfect to talk about this issue, that's Matt Babin. He's head of energy and natural resources at Palantir. Matt, thanks for being with us, appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I was talking off camera with someone earlier today who said he felt that the energy industry was perhaps not as far along when it comes to AI as perhaps some other industries. Would you agree with that assessment? Why and kind of how, are, how do you get them up to speed? Yeah, um, I think I disagree with that assessment actually. Uh, maybe we take contrarian takes to a lot of things at Palantir, <laughs> but I think the energy industry has been using artificial intelligence and machine learning for over a decade. They've just been using it in a different way than, than we're speaking of it right now. If you think of things like deterministic models and reservoir simulations, high performance computing centers, the energy industry has been using that technology for a long time. What I think is interesting is the proliferation of speed of development of what we're seeing now in large language models in gen AI pieces is causing the energy industry to think of using technology differently. Right? Um, I think the energy industry moves sometimes on longer cycles. Right, A boom or bust of the commodity takes three or four years. Procurement can take a year. Uh, information security reviews can take six months. In the last year, we've had GPT-4, Turbo, Vision, Aramco announcing MetaBrain. That's four huge large language models all in the space of one procurement cycle. And so where I think the energy industry can move faster is sort of experimenting and adopting some of these new technologies in an accelerated fashion. Um, how do they do, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know how, how, and how is Gen AI specifically going to be, uh, you know, pertinent to them or helpful to them? Yeah, I think it'll be different for different companies. And I think that's probably the first big trap is that some people are looking at AI as a tool and then finding a problem. And I think the companies that are doing this successfully are finding a particular problem they want to solve and then looking to technology as a lever to do that. So perhaps that's that you want to reduce your power consumption in the field, or you want to better track your emissions profile and mitigation. Uh, you want to have fewer suppliers or fewer supply chain interruptions. Those are all great places where you can use AI and machine learning and bound models to solve problems, but that all starts with finding the right problem rather than just saying you're going to use the technology. Now, in terms of who you guys are working with, I know you've worked with BP for quite some time as a client, Kinder Morgan, another that you're working with. So can you just give us a couple of, for me, the challenge with AI is always wrapping my head around concrete examples of yeah. what it is doing right now. Can you give us a couple of examples? Sure. There's two classes of problems that I think are, are the best fit for this technology right now. Um, and both involve bottlenecks. So how are you using technology to get through a bottleneck? The first one is on context. So let's say that I'm a petroleum engineer working on an asset. And I'm trying to answer the question of, is my asset producing as well as it can? Well, what does well mean there? Does it mean as many barrels of oil as possible? Does it mean as little water? Does it mean lower carbon? Does it mean lower cost of maintenance? It could mean any of those things. And those all pull different data sets at different times from different tools. You can use a large language model to help answer that question, right? And that enables you to then solve different objective functions at different times. The second type of problem is one around uh, capacity. So let's say that my job is approving some element of a process. I'm approving invoices. I'm approving utility bills that I get for my assets in the field. I'm evaluating pig runs in a midstream company for integrity issues, right? Those are all things where, again, AI and a large language model can help me triage those more appropriately. I have a limited amount of bandwidth and capacity. I want to put my smartest brains on the hardest problems, not on procedural problems. And how do I use AI as a triage tool to get through those more fast, more quickly? Interesting. So you've talked about what it can do for energy companies. What is the energy opportunity for Palantir? How big a business is it now? and how big do you want it to be? Yeah, um, we've been in energy for over a decade, although a lot of people don't know that from, from uh, the, the beginning. You know, I think our technology, building on what we built for the government at the very beginning, sort of a real, real focus on privacy, on data protection, uh, in the government context that looks like civil liberties, for commercial entities that looks like data protection and, and security, we're most successful in highly regulated industries, right? Where you're not, you're never gonna turn to a black box model and say, I'm gonna drill this well because a model told me to. 
I'm going to approve this patient for treatment because a model told me to. So if you look at our, our largest commercial industries of heavy manufacturing, energy and oil and gas, utilities, and healthcare, those are all heavily regulated industries where decisions really matter. Um, you know, the energy industry is, is one of our three or four biggest sort of planks of our commercial business, but I think it's very small compared to what it will be a year, two years, five years from now. And when it comes to these energy companies, you know, from what you described, helping them with these large language models, helping them with AI, are they collecting the data and then you're helping them on that side of it? Or are you also helping with some of the data collection at this point? We never do data collection. Okay. Um, we never own data. We are never a data owner, data broker, data seller. Uh, our customers, we provide them software and they use that software to interrogate, analyze, and make decisions on their own data. They own that data. They own what we call the ontology, which we think is sort of the most important point of, you know, a large language model knows nothing about your business. Large language models are fascinating pieces of technology, but if you are Exxon or BP or Kinder, they don't know your business and they don't know what you're trying to do. The ontology is what binds that large language model to those nouns and verbs of your business, uh, but customers own all of their own data. Okay, Matt Babin of Palantir, thank you so much. Really thank you for having me. It. That was Yahoo Finance's Julie Hyman and Palantir Head of Energy and Natural Resources, Matt Babin. Time now for What to Watch Tuesday, March 19th, starting out with the Fed. Second FOMC meeting of the year starting tomorrow. Wall Street is not expecting a rate cut in March, but will look for more clues toward later in the year. It's coming ahead of the Fed announcing its decision on Wednesday, but it will also release its economic projections. Right, and that's going to be critical to look at. But moving over to the housing sector, monthly data on housing starts and building permits for February coming out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Economists expecting both numbers to go up from January, and this comes against the backdrop of the Nas National Association of Retailers' proposed settlement. The association agreeing to pay $418 million to compensate home sellers paying inflated commission costs to sell their homes. And shifting to earnings, Tencent Music and Xpeng both reporting tomorrow. Xpeng announcing fourth quarter results before the bell. Chinese EV maker getting hammered to start the year. It's down more than 30%, but trading up today ahead of those earnings. And finally, tune in tomorrow for Yahoo Finance's continuing coverage of Sarah Week from Houston, Texas, including an interview with ExxonMobil CEO Darren Woods. You're not going to want to miss that. Now, I am interested in this FOMC meeting, Josh. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I no. give Riff. my take on this? Go. So here's the issue. At what point do they have to give us some sort of thesis, some sort of guiding statement that makes their goals clearer than 2% in data dependent. Because if you say you're data dependent and the data continues to be mm -hmm. a pick your narrative, cherry pick the data, it's very hard for us to suss out what exactly they're going to be getting any sort of conviction on. And that's why we're left with this hemming and hawing from Jay Powell when we need to know what the Fed is gonna be doing moving forward and the Fed doesn't want to surprise the market but they're not giving us any sort of clarity. So I'm interested in seeing how much they're gonna let the market run before they talk about the easing of financial conditions and talk about whether or not that is changing fundamentally their view moving forward. I just yeah. want something. No, there'll be, there'll be a lot of interesting dot plot, balance sheet, and Jay Powell's rhetoric all in focus. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm watching NVIDIA, big AI conference going on right now, Maddie, as we speak. I'm, I'm sitting here waiting for headlines. Bank of America dubbed this event the AI Woodstock. Mm -hmm. We saw that just how big and important it really is. Jensen Wong is going to be delivering the keynote. Expectations running red hot. Stock has clocked 10 straight positive weeks. Bloomberg pointing out, by the way, that is its longest winning streak in NVIDIA's history yeah. as a public company. So can Jensen Wong kind of keep momentum going? What does he say about new products? What does he say about where the industry is and where it's going? New partnerships, new collaborations? We'll wait and see. Yeah, we'll wait and see. I mean, it's interesting. We continue to hear from our guests that NVIDIA is a more important news item this week mm -hmm. than the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what Jay Powell wants to hear. They want to hear that they are having some control over this market versus just the AI rally continuing to move things forward. So it'll definitely be interesting for us to watch. That's going to do it for today's market domination overtime. Be sure to come back tomorrow for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned for more Yahoo Finance on the other side as we kick off the brand new season of our series next. We're diving into a huge challenge facing retailers, theft. Stay tuned to see the full story on how the industry is cracking down by using AI. That's coming up when Yahoo Finance returns.
One big issue from retailers this past quarter, theft, commonly referred to as shrink. The threats we face are well beyond your traditional brick and mortar stealing of health and beauty products. What is the next big technology that retailers have gotten really excited about? Really artificial intelligence, AI, that can pick up glass breaking, gunshots. Could something like this prevent theft from happening at all? It better. This is what's next in retail theft prevention. Major retailers from Target to Ross stores still struggling with theft. One solution, AI-powered technology that aims to stop crime before it happens. I got an exclusive look at that and more for our season two premiere of our series next. Take a look. Just in from Target, they announced plans to close nine locations. One big issue from retailers this past quarter, theft, commonly referred to as shrink. You've seen these viral videos showing flash mob style smash and grabs. That theft is hitting profits at some of the biggest retailers, including Target, Walgreens, and Home Depot. Mentions of organized retail crime on company earnings calls went up by 43% from January through August of 2023. One of the buzzwords on those calls was shrink, an industry term to describe any hit to inventory. Shrink-related losses hit $112 billion in 2022. Organized retail crime isn't just impacting margins. Retailers say the theft is more violent now than ever. In response, they're doing what once would have been unthinkable, partnering with their direct competitors to use an AI-driven heat map 
that'll enable retailers to share real-time crime data with each other, all in the hopes of stopping theft before it hits any store. But if theft creeps in anyway, AI-powered surveillance will be listening in. This is what's next in retail theft prevention. We've got what we call the engagement lab. Can we take a look? Absolutely. Let's All right, go. let's get in here. It's the only place in the world like it. All of this is really, um, but they can see almost 400 different technologies in the same place. That's Reed Hayes. He's the head of the University of Florida's Loss Prevention Lab, which has taken in more than 400 anti-theft technologies from dozens of companies. Customer service is on the way to your aisle to help you immediately. The lab evaluates how effective the tech could be in the real world. We set up the simulation or sim lab, as we call it, to allow us to do more rapid research and learnings. We put active criminal offenders in here, we put shoppers, we put employees, and we can look at different areas and we can do it much more rapidly and we can do it without disrupting the actual store. Reed and his team are funded by the university and by the Loss Prevention Research Council. That's a group of nearly 100 of the most recognizable retailers. They pay an annual membership fee of $6,500 per year to access Reed's research. What is the next big technology that retailers have gotten really excited about when they visit the lab? Really artificial intelligence, AI, computer vision that can spot somebody that might be concealing goods, obviously bringing a firearm or a cutting instrument into the store. They're interested in AI that can pick up screaming, glass breaking, gunshots, but also helping us analyze activity at a more macro scale using mapping and AI. Reed says he's using AI powered mapping in a way it's never been used before and in a way that encourages retailers to collaborate with their biggest competitors. The redder that they are, the hotter they are, the more crime risk in that area. The map uses AI to predict future crime events by pulling in data from as many sources as possible, from law enforcement to the retailers themselves. That data creates hotspots on the map, which participating retailers can see. The next step, equipping stores with two-way radios and an app that'll automatically notify managers if a crime happens at a nearby store. Could something like this prevent theft from happening at all? It better, it should. The theft problem is a difficult one to quantify. One report from the National Retail Federation attributed nearly half of shrink for 2021 to organized retail crime. The NRF later retracted that claim. In congressional testimony, one economist said organized retail crime is responsible for just about 5% of total retail inventory losses. Where do you think the disconnect is in that data? What we do is we look at retailer data. So if we rely on public information, law enforcement information, um, that's very inaccurate. Not their fault. They only know what people tell them. Retailers say it's hitting company profits. In 2022, Lowe's lost nearly $1 billion, more than 1% of their net sales. Target projected a nearly $500 million hit, all due to shrink. And retailers are paying up to try and stop it. One survey showed that more than 52% of retailers say they're spending more money on theft prevention. And for good reason. Over 60% of people called their most recent experience with locked cases, the primary tool for theft prevention, inconvenient. 20% said they'd rather order online than wait for an employee. And that's a problem for retailers that are already competing with e-commerce. That's why retailers are increasingly interested in giving the customer more autonomy through innovations like Face ID technology. I put in my cell phone number. I would get a code to my phone and then I would type in that code here. And now the Bingo. case is open. But I have to give up my cell phone number. That's right. But think about how much we give up online. We give our name, our address, our credit card number, all these, all this information, phone numbers, email, just to buy online. Could this eventually be face ID technology? Yeah. That way you can say, hey, here I am. I'm not in a database of stealing from here. It opens for you. To find better solutions, retailers are coming together at events like the NRF's annual big show in New York City. That's one of the biggest retail conferences. There, I caught up with Reed again, this time with one of his lab members. We went down to visit Dr. Hayes in his lab. We set it, we had an ideation meeting uh, for a day or so and great takeaways from that. 
That's Mike Lamb, who's done asset protection for decades, working for Home Depot, Walmart, and just before retirement, Kroger. I'm seeing more of this collaboration than perhaps ever in my four decades plus of being in this space, and it's so refreshing to see that. That's why we exist as a council, uh, 94 retail corporations now, um, and they want to collaborate, and they're figuring out how do we collaborate better for everybody's safety. Our primary ambition is, is to do just that, provide that safe environment for both customers and associates, and technology and AI in particular, I think are going to help us along that journey. Experts in loss prevention we've spoken to say the future of safe shopping lies in AI's ability to prevent a crime before it even happens. The goal for retailers is to not impede the shopping experience. So this is the type of technology shoppers won't see, but it will be there, listening and watching. We're looking at a whole lot of other AI plays here, uh, picking up on what people are saying, like threatening words or victims' words, things like that, that we think we can also map more in real time. Over 90% of U.S. retail respondents to one survey plan to increase their AI investments this year. But questions remain about the legality and privacy of AI-powered surveillance. At the end of 2023, the Federal Trade Commission banned Rite Aid from using AI facial recognition technology. They said Rite Aid's practices contributed to the risk of consumers experiencing discrimination. The FTC also issued a general warning to companies using biometric surveillance, indicating that they'll be cracking down on misuse of that technology, which retailers like Rite Aid implemented to curb theft. And it's not just about retailers collecting information. I think we just, as law enforcement, need to be smart about where we're collecting information from and how you know, we would traditionally collect that information, whether it be through legal process or not. We always say responsible use of machine learning and data analytics and different you know, technologies will help us be better at our job. That's Special Agent Mike Kroll, who oversees the Department of Homeland Security's Operation Boiling Point an effort aimed at fighting the rise in organized retail crime, which he testified on in front of Congress. HSI initiated Operation Boiling Point 2.0 to effectively communicate the severity of organized theft groups involved in retail crime. To help track the severity of theft, Kroll's team created an AI-powered tool called Raven that uses machine learning to consolidate crime data across multiple jurisdictions, all in an effort to find links between individual crimes. So I think last year we had about a 200% increase in our investigations related to organized retail crime. Is it fair to say that the scope of retail theft reached somewhat of a boiling point where the Department of Homeland Security needed to get involved? The threats we face are well beyond your traditional brick and mortar, you know, stealing of toothpaste and health and beauty products. We're into sophisticated networks, many Chinese organizations who have taken to the cyber realm to conduct intrusions and, and other technical methodologies to, to steal information, to steal items, and then to turn that into a profit. People just want to make money. How often are you getting leads from retailers? Every day. As retailers work to address a problem that HSI says is increasingly severe, Reed says consumers' privacy concerns will still need to be prioritized by retailers and law enforcement. When it comes to pushback, I don't know that we've had any pushback from a current or potential crime victim, but there are people outside that are concerned. I think more and more of the retailers are saying we've got to safeguard our people in these spaces. So now they're putting things that would arguably invade someone's privacy, but nobody goes to jail based on an alert on any kind of AI technology. It's a heads up, decision maker, and then you make the call what you want to do. You can see more new tech that's in development at that research lab by heading to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. And there you can watch an extended version of our season two premiere of Next.
Synopsis is NVIDIA's literally first software partner. They were there in the very first day of our company. Synopsis revolutionized the chip industry with high-level design. We are going to CUDA accelerate Synopsis. We're accelerating computational lithography, one of the most important applications that nobody's ever known about. In order to make chips, we have to push lithography to a limit. That was NVIDIA founder and CEO Jensen Huan moments ago. He announced software partnerships just before unveiling a new GPU chip called Blackwell at the GTC event. Joining us now is Synovus Trust Senior Portfolio Manager Dan Morgan. Dan, thank you for being here to react to some I'm of this sense. news. Uh, what do you think the investor reaction should be right off the bat to the news about the Blackwell chips introduction here? Well, I was actually watching the uh, telecast like you were earlier before I came on the camera. And uh, you know, I think everything so far has gone very positive. It's pretty much in line with expectations, Madison. You know, thought process coming into this, where they were going to introduce a new line of chips called Blackwell. Um, they also mentioned the Grace Blackwell 200, which is more advanced chip. They have a whole new family of chips coming out. He also talked about the superior technology in this existing chip over the current Hopper 100, which is the H100. So it kind of leads you to believe that this is something that's going to replace the current chip that's out there right now. So I think what we have to gather from this, Madison and Josh, is that we've had a lot of announcements recently from a lot of different companies about new chips, AI chips that they have coming out. And I think what we're seeing is NVIDIA kind of punching back with their new and greatest technology. You have to bear in mind they have about 70% market share. So these other guys are playing catch up. And so they want to show they're not just going to sit back and let other companies like AMD and, and so forth come out with chips and not respond back. So that's what I think this is a big part of. And I expect uh, you know, them to continue to maintain that, that pole position right now. How much, Daniel, you look at this stock and just what a remarkable rally it's been, Dan. It's up about 80% already just this year. How much good news do you think we're pricing in here? Well, there is a lot of good news, Josh, and the stock trades at a very high multiple, obviously, when you look at the trail. If you look at it versus upcoming fiscal year 25, it's, it's not a huge multiple. But, you know, at this point, uh, you know, I wrote a piece, who's going to be the first one to three trillion? Is it going to be Apple, Am or excuse me, Amazon or Google or NVIDIA? And I think you'd have to say right now, NVIDIA is in the better position just from a growth perspective. So. Uh, even though I expect the comparisons to kind of slow down a little bit in terms of what they have been over the last four quarters, I still expect them to grow at a very strong rate. So, um, you know, Josh, when you got a great stock like NVIDIA, you just got to kind of let it run. Everybody wants to find that sell point and get out and find that perfect moment. But I, feel, I think, still think you got a ways to go. So let me, <laughs> let me ask you, that, you, you, could you cause some folks, have, I'm sure you've heard this, they, they look at the run NVIDIA's had and other just AI related names, the surge, Dan, and, and you've heard this, um, this reaction that it's a kind of classic stock bubble. Uh, do you believe that, Dan? What's your response when you hear that? Well, I don't believe that, Josh, because if we look at NVIDIA, it's a company that we can actually see tangible evidence that AI is directly impacting profits. And there are few other companies that we can say that about. Like uh, today we had the announcement with uh, Apple and uh, Alphabet and the Gemini AI engine. And so it's kind of hard, it's a great announcement, sounds really good, but how are we going to parse through that? Where are we going to see actual financial results? Um, if you think about Josh, I've been in this business since 87. So I went through the tech bubble back in late, you know, 1999, 2000, summer of 2000. And it doesn't feel anything like that today because you have companies that are obviously have very good earnings, they're doing very well, they have very established businesses, lots of cash on the balance sheet. So I don't feel we're in a dot com or AI dot com bubble at this point. I think we're at the beginning of something big and uh, there are going to be companies that aren't going to benefit from it as much as everybody thinks they are. But I think NVIDIA is one that is going to benefit and obviously that will show up in the stock price. Well, talk to me about what stocks we can anticipate rising off of this news throughout the course of this week. We're seeing Synopsys up, unsurprisingly, a little over 3% here. NVIDIA, though, a little bit flat, which is a little surprising to me here. I'm curious what stocks our audience of investors on the Yahoo Finance platform should be looking at throughout the rest of the week to suss out how this news is landing. 
Well, Madison, obviously you're going to get a boost to AMD. We know that they have the MI300A, MI300X. That's their latest AI chips that they recently brought out. Also, a lot of people won't talk about Intel, but they have the Gandhi 3, which mm -hmm. is actually going to be rolling out pretty soon. They have Falcon Shores. So they have some chips coming down the pipe. You have Marvel, obviously, with their PAM DSP4 chip. That's obviously going to, should benefit from this. We know that um, Broadcom reported a couple weeks ago, and they don't have a pure play chip, but they do have accelerators and other products that are AI related. So those would be some of the chip players that I would expect to really benefit from the NVIDIA news coming out, kind of names that we know about. And then, you know, Madison and Josh, we switch it over and we look at companies that are currently developing their own chips. You don't really think of Alphabet, but they have the Tensor uh, chip that they're developing with uh, Broadcom. So you have a lot of these companies that are buyers of chips, AI chips that are in the process of developing their own chip. Meta, for example, has two chips they just released a couple of months ago. Uh, that they're developing in the AI space that they would use as an alternative to, let's say, the H100 for NVIDIA. So you have kind of a force of the chip competitors, and then you have companies that use the chips that are developing their own AI chips that should benefit from what's happening with NVIDIA. So it's kind of a two-prong attack. <laughs> Dan, always love having you on the show. Thanks as always for your time oh, and insight. Thanks, John. Coming up. We'll continue to dive into the latest from NVIDIA. Stay tuned, more Yahoo Finance on the other side. There's no memory locality issues, no cache issues. It's just one giant chip. 
And so uh, when we were told that Blackwell's ambitions were beyond the limits of physics, uh, the engineer said, so what? And so this is what, what happened. And so this is the Blackwell chip. That was NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan unveiling the newest GPU from the chip maker, as he just mentioned, called the Blackwell chip. Now, what's interesting here, Josh, is that it's actually two chips kind of married to each other, um, pushed together. It's definitely more complicated than that. But in my language, it's two chips pushed together here. Uh, TM, TSMC is going to use uh, this technique that they, they have called the 4MP to produce that product. But because it's so big, you can kind of see Jensen Huan pointing out the size of this kind of super chip here. Uh, it's going to require a unique production technique. And I'm curious about who is going to benefit from that. Obviously, TSMC to start out. But the other players in the space are going to have to get the capabilities, the manufacturing and production capabilities to produce this chip moving forward if they want to continue to win when it comes to the chip's production side of this story. Yeah, and Blackwell, um, you know, remember, this is the successor to NVIDIA's so-called Hopper, which has just helped yep. supercharge NVIDIA's top line. The flagship from that lineup is, is the H100 that we talk so much about. Um, CEO Jensen Wong is saying that these new Blackwell chips are the engine to power this new industrial revolution. Um, also, NVIDIA is saying here they expect Blackwell adoption by a number of, of, it looks like big names. They're calling out Google and Dell and Meta and AWS. You know, we talk a lot about NVIDIA for good reason, um, Maddie, because it is simply the face of this boom of interest in AI. They right. are the number one leader in AI training chips. And, and there is competition. We were just talking to Dan Morgan. And obviously, when you see a stock move like this, you can expect competition. So it's, it's Intel, it's AMD, and very importantly, NVIDIA's own big customers, those, those big cloud giants, the hyperscalers as well. Right, and of course, we're going to see some of those names moving up. Already seeing Broadcom and Intel up. Just to kind of bring it home for people, though, in terms of what this means, uh, Jensen Huan did kind of mention what this will look like in practice, saying that instead of the AI tools kind of recognizing an image, for example, you're going to be able to potentially say to an AI tool, make me a video of Josh Lipton mm -hmm. and I angering Yahoo Finance, and it'll be able to do it. So just bringing that extra juice and power to these AI tools that we haven't necessarily had prior to this. I think you get, you get. I mean, one of us, we're only one hour into this keynote. You have a whole mm -hmm. other hour of Jensen Wong, so we'll see what other news comes. But I think already you're kind of seeing bulls come on the show, Madison, and when they kind of pound the table for NVIDIA, often what they'll talk about is some of what we're seeing right now is they'll say, listen, it's chips, it's software. What he's doing really is building a platform. Yeah, you know? absolutely, makes sense. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.